Good morning. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm also happy to be talking immediately after we saw um, this uh, fantastic um, uh, video about uh, the difference between what technology can enable us and uh, but what is our what are the moral imperatives around how to use it i 'm going to show you what technology can help us uh, achieve in learning about organizations, the moral and political questions about how we should use the technologies to actually um, manage people in organizations uh, is an entirely different one that I think we ha need to have an important discussion about. So uh, the title of the talk is What Can We Learn About Culture from Linguistic Analysis? The short answer is a lot. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll try, uh, I'll be able to persuade you uh, that we can learn uh, interesting things um, that we could not have um, hitherto without access to the kind of data that the information technology has provided us with. Um, the research that I'm going to presenting, uh, uh, be presenting today comes out of the uh, Computational Culture Lab, which I co-direct with my good friend and collaborator, Samir Srivastava, at UC Berkeley. Um, and the work that you will see today uh, could not have been done without uh, the work and dedication of many fantastic and brilliant uh, PhD students um, that uh, you can see here on this slide. Um, so I want to start by um, uh, making a statement uh, that culture matters in organizations, which is something that organizations and people who speak about organizations and corporations in the United States in particular are becoming increasingly um, cognizant of. Uh, this guy, Terence uh, Kalanick, uh, discovered that uh, uh, a, f a couple of years ago when he was forced out of the company that uh, he founded uh, on the grounds of facilitating the kind of bro culture uh, that was uh, uh, accused of being misogynistic. Um, uh, a, a couple uh, a years earlier, uh, Ellen Pao, also here in Silicon Valley, uh, um, was um, um, uh, sued her uh, employer at the time, uh, one of the leading VC companies, Kleiner Perkins, uh, for gender discrimination. And interesting, um, a twist in that story was that the courts rejected her lawsuit um, and accepted the argument by, by Kleiner Perkins that yes, uh, Ms. Powell was a, was a high performer, but she did not fit in culturally. So even the legal institutions acknowledge culture as, as an important um, um, uh, form of productivity in organizations. And one question that we ask ourselves is, what makes people fit in culturally uh, into their organizations? And there have been two general problems in how both practitioners and researchers have, have um, um, access that question. So the first is a conceptual one. Imagine that this circle represents an organization and, and this uh, is an individual applying to the organization. The way by which people tend to think about cultural fit is this radial movement from the outside to the center whereby there's cultural matching at the hiring phase, there's a short period of socialization, euphemistically known as onboarding these days in organizations, and eventually uh, the member reaches uh, uh, the center of the, of the organization, becomes a full bond member of the organization. The problem with this conceptualization is that uh, organizations are living organisms that evolve and change, and the cultures in them uh, do that as well. So I think we should think of, of this rather than as a radial movement from the outside to the inside, as a, a more as a journey that one takes and needs to put energy, cognitive and emotional energy into uh, throughout. And importantly, uh, these two phases, I think, relate to very different types of mechanism. It's, um, Early on, the ability to fit in is going to uh, affect mostly how peers accept you, whereas later on, um, your willingness and commitment and motivation to continue that journey uh, will be related to your attachment, and we'll be looking at those uh, with respect to different outcomes, whether you were rejected and therefore um, uh, removed involuntarily from or the organization as opposed to whether you uh, left it voluntarily. But really, the kind of uh, imagery I want to think of is, is rather than thinking about uh, a fit as an end state, I want to think about enculturation as a process, as a journey that one takes in their organizational life that they need to put work um, uh, emotional and cognitive into. And the uh, argument uh, that we're going to make is that different mechanisms have very different um, enculturation signatures. They um, translate into different patterns of enculturation in the organization. An upward trajectory will be an indication of one's successful assimilation. An inability uh, to adapt uh, will result in uh, failure to gain acceptance and therefore uh, uh, leaving uh, the organization involuntarily. And importantly, a decline in one's cultural alignment uh, post their ability to, have, uh, uh, to adapt, but um, uh, their decision to cease to take the journey is going to pertain, uh, portend their departure as it reflects their waning attachment to the organization. 
but with that comes the second problem, which is a methodological one, which is how do we actually measure culture and how do we measure culture over time and cultural fit um, as it relates to people's behavior in an organization. Traditionally, people have used self-reports to do that. Um, and those suffer, those have a, a good adva uh, um, a many advantages, but they suffer from a variety of problems. They can't be uh, done at scale. Um, people um, uh, get uh, very quickly tired of doing them. Imagine that you would have to do a cultural fit um, survey every day in an organization. It's basically impossible to observe people's enacted cultural fit in the organization on a daily basis. And our approach has been to use language as reflected in the linguistic traces that people leave in their uh, interactions in their organization. I'm going to show you specifically an analysis of email exchange, but this could apply to any form of linguistic exchange between individuals of a group or an organization. And we developed something known as the Interactional Language Use Model of Cultural Fit. Um, also with colleagues here, uh, Chris Potts at the um, uh, Linguistics Department here at Stanford. And the idea is the following. We define uh, individual eyes, uh, cultural fit at time t, time t is going to be months, um, as uh, the similarity between two distributions, distribution of linguistic categories and eyes outgoing and incoming messages. So basically, the level of congruence in the language that I use is in communicating with others and that others use in communicating uh, with I. Uh, we're going to use something known as the Yen Chan and divergence. I put this formula only so that I can assert my mathematical authority, and uh, we're not going to uh, actually, uh, but it's a fairly uh, a common a way of measuring um, congruence between distributions. And we're using the Luke lexicon, uh, which is a higher level abstraction of, of categories of words as the linguistic units. To give you just one example, swearing is one of the categories in the Luke dictionary. What we find is that swearing is a very strong signal of your level of fit in the organization. The point being not that we're making arguments about whether it's appropriate or is good or bad to swear. Uh, the point is whether one swears at the appropriate level as is expected uh, normatively in their organizations. And you can imagine that there are organizations where swearing is a huge faux pas, and, and, and one swearing is a strong indication of their inability to fit in, as opposed to other organizations where swearing is a way to assert your authority, your status, and not swearing would be an indication of not fitting in. And we're not making any normative uh, arguments about whether one is, is better than the other. Than the other. And the analysis um, that we're doing uh, is applied to a, a, a company that was kind enough to uh, give us access to all their email exchange um, and um, also high quality personal data and specifically uh, departure data and reasons for departure. Uh, we analyze these data over a period of several years. Uh, we observe several hundred individuals as their um, tenure in the organization unfolds. Um, we an analyze both the content of their emails and who they um, uh, communicate with so that we can apply our interactional language use model um, to their emails. And these are generally um, uh, our findings. So we find very consistent with the literature hitherto that cultural fit predicts a variety of measures of attainment in organizations. So for example, we see that um, people who fit in, and this is um, on the x-axis, we see cultural fit in standard deviations. Uh, so roughly people at the, um, at the two ends are at the extremes of cultural fit in, in the organization. We see that an increase uh, from being a very low cultural fit to a high cultural fit increases the likelihood of getting a high performance evaluation by, all, by almost 90%. It increases your monthly bonus for those who receive bonus in the organization on orders of hundreds of dollars and can be uh, hundreds of percents of increase in their income. Uh, it also uh, predicts uh, the likelihood of you being uh, asked to involuntarily leave the organization. This is what we see here is over your three years in the organization, the cumulative likelihood that you will be fired. We see here that people in red who are low cultural fit individuals have a dramatic uh, a likelihood of being fired by three years. It's almost 50% by looking at their cultural fit alone is derived from the language that they use in the organization of being um, fired from the organization. But you might ask yourself, wait a second, you gave us this whole spiel about taking a journey and not looking at, at, uh, at, at at um, uh, absolute numbers, and indeed that is what I want to get into uh, uh, right now. This is what the average individual in the organization looks like. As you see, um, as a function of the time of the months that they're employed, uh, the average person increases from low cultural fit to high cultural fit. Uh, the grayed out area represents the confidence interval, so where we think uh, at 95% likelihood the true uh, uh, number that we're estimating uh, lies. So as you can see, the average newcomer starts with low cultural 
fit and gradually increasing it uh, by 12 months, reaching the average level of cultural fit uh, in the organization. Uh, but as I alluded to earlier, we find very different patterns in, diff in different people's enculturation trajectories as a function of their ultimate outcomes in the organization. So people that we observe um, who are retained during our window of observation generally show uh, a, drama uh, a gradual increase in their cultural fit. People who are involuntarily departed demonstrate a decline in their cultural fit. Uh, but most interestingly, I think, is people who are voluntarily departed demonstrate the capacity to adapt, but sometime, um, and we, we look here at the x-axis as, as their tenure in the organization, so sometime at the half-life uh, in the organization, they say to themselves, you know what, this is a kumbaya organization, but I'm going to start dropping F-bombs in my emails nevertheless, even though nobody um, uh, swears here. And that for us is an indication of their declining attachment to the organization, their unwillingness to kind of um, adhere to the uh, normative conventions uh, in the organization, and that portends their decision uh, to depart voluntarily. Importantly, what we see here is that at point of entry, immediately after point of entry, these confidence intervals interlap, uh, overlap. Sorry. So what this tells us is that these individuals are indistinguishable immediately after they are hired into the organization. It's the journey that they take in the organization and the shape of their enculturation pattern that really gives us information about whether they will survive or whether they will be leaving or whether they will be voluntarily uh, departing the organization. So with that in mind, we ask ourselves, so what, does ma what matters more? Is it the level of, of cultural fit uh, that you have immediately as you join or is it the, um, your ability to adapt and what we see here is the cumulative probability, again, of uh, involuntarily leaving the organization uh, as a function of, of the months employed, but differentiating between people uh, here in blue who start with very low initial fit but are very fast to enculturate versus those who, those who start with high initial fit but are very slow to enculturate and relative to the median newcomer in the organization. And what we see is that people here in red are significantly more likely to be fired. So it's not so much about uh, whether you were matched at the point of hiring correctly and whether you uh, understand the organization immediately at point of entry. It is whether you have the capacity to learn the cultural code and adapt your behaviors to it that reflects your ability to succeed uh, in the organization. And finally, on, on this uh, uh, line of work, we ask ourselves, OK, uh, so we see how people behave, um, and, but we don't really know what they think, what is informing their behavioral decisions, and can we get some access to that? And uh, uh, in asking that question and teaming with uh, Jenny Chapman, who is an organizational psychologist at Berkeley, uh, we also conducted a set of surveys using uh, the organizational cultural profile, uh, a, a validated method of measuring culture in a, in a traditional survey-based uh, approach in the organization. And doing that, we constructed two measures. Um, a common measure known as value congruence, which is a similarity between an individual's desired culture, so what they think is the ideal uh, organizational culture they would like to work at, uh, relative to what other people report is the actual normative environment in the organization. And we distinguish that from one's perceptual accuracy. We ask also individuals not only what they desire, but also what they observe. And we see whether what they report is actually happening in the organization is congruent with what other people report. And what we find is that our measure of linguistic cultural fit is highly related to perceptual accuracy, but as you can see here, um, uh, is insignificantly related to value congruence telling us that the people who are able to behave appropriately, the people who swear at the appropriate level, are not necessarily the people who have the value orientations that are congruent with the organization, but those are the people who have the capacity to read the organizational code. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what distinguishes these type of people from the others? Why is it that some people read um, the organizational cultural code better than others? One approach that you might say is, well, there's just people who are better at it, and there are certain psychological distinctions between them. We find no correlation between um, the traditional ways of measuring personality and other psychological traits and one's ability to enact culture appropriately or not in the organization. What we do find, however, that is that it is highly dependent on the quality of one's peers. And what we do here is we exploit a reorganization that happened uh, during our, our period of observation where people 
the whole organization was basically restructured. So people almost somewhat quasi randomly were matched with new peers as they were moving to new teams. And we exploited that. And what we see here is in blue, we see people who experienced a boost in the quality and the cultural fit of their peers versus people here in red who uh, experienced a decline in the cultural fit of their peers. And what we see is that these individuals' cultural fit immediately after um, um, the reorganization either goes up or goes down as the function of the individuals who become their team members telling us that it's not only about indiv inherent individual differences about people's capacity to read the cultural code, which is innate to their psychology. It's also about the context, the types of individuals that they learn the cultural code from. So that would suggest that if we, um, um, you know, if you accept our findings that the cultural journey that one takes matters and it is important for people's both um, uh, their productivity and their sense of attachment in the organization, if we, we might be able to empower them by matching them early on in their careers in the organization uh, to people who would be good mentors and guides into the cultural code of the organization. So you might leave this conversation thinking to yourself, wait a second, you portrayed a very kind of homogenous um, uh, picture of the contemporary American uh, organization whereby conformity is the most important thing. People who learn the code, people who uh, internalize the code, people who adhere to the code uh, benefit from that adherence and people uh, who think outside the box, who swear even though it's inappropriate, are being penalized um, for um, their lack of conformity. And we live in an age where, uh, at last, uh, uh, questions of diversity uh, have come uh, to the foreground of uh, political and also sociological and organizational discussions uh, um, about what's right and what's productive in organizations. And um, uh, I don't want you to leave um, uh, this conversation by thinking that the only imperative in managing culture organ in organization is creating a, a homogenous uh, type of environment. However, uh, the research that exists so far, uh, and in fact the question of diversity, cultural diversity in organizations has been studied uh, for many years uh, uh, by organizational scholars, uh, but for many years it has been kind of been off the radar uh, of uh, mainstream uh, political um, uh, discourse. Um, this research has uh, tended to suggest that diversity presents itself uh, as a trade-off in uh, organizations. On the one hand, on the one hand, sorry, a diversity of ideas uh, promotes creativity, innovation, and adaptation. There's a lot of work to suggest that when you bring people uh, who come from different backgrounds, who have different ways of thinking about the world, you increase the likelihood that they will collectively generate innovation and creativity. At the same time, however, when you bring people who have different ideas and, and, and thoughts about the world, you also make it more difficult for them to coordinate because they have different expectations, different expectations from each other's uh, behavior, and therefore you might be undermining execution. And the kind of underlying assumption in organizational research over the last several decades has, has been that there's a trade-off. That when organizations promote innovation through diversity, they undercut their execution and that organizations need to make strategic decisions about what's more important for them, to be innovative or to execute efficiently. And we're arguing that that might be a slightly simplistic way of, of thinking about the problem, and particularly uh, because there are different ways by which diversity manifests. It's not a singular construct, in fact. Uh, we're arguing that it has at least two dimensions. And to exemplify what I mean by that, imagine again an organization here represented by a circle, and these are the individuals um, um, inhabiting that organization. So one way of thinking of, of diversity, which is the traditional way, is to think that it inheres in differences between individuals. So imagine that there are only two types of beliefs in the world, A and B, and there are two types of people, A and B people. Uh, an analog might be some people speak Chinese, some people speak French, and the people who speak Chinese don't understand the people who speak French, and therefore uh, you might have a lot of ideas in this organization, but uh, these different people might find it very difficult to coordinate with one another because the A's and the B's don't understand one another. However, you can also think of diversity as inhering in, um, uh, diver in um, uh, differences within individuals, not necessarily between individuals. So imagine, again, another organization that has at the aggregate, the same level of distribution of ideas. However, 
as opposed to in the first organization where these ideas are differentially distributed across people, in the right-hand side, these ideas are distributed within people. So we have this organization to continue the uh, linguistic uh, analog where everybody speaks both French and Chinese and they do the connecting of the ideas uh, together. And we argue that uh, you could create organizations that um, facilitate um, uh, broad cultures where everybody uh, accepts multiple ideas about what is appropriate or not appropriate in the organization. To test that, um, uh, we measured cultural diversity between and within employee um, using uh, uh, reviews uh, that employees write on Glassdoor, which is a leading uh, employer review website. We did this with the full collaboration of Glassdoor, which, is, uh, which has provided great support uh, to our research. The way that we approach this problem is we employ a, a technology known as topic modeling, or the underlying statistical model is called latent Dirichlet allocation. The idea is the following. You read millions of, of documents documents, um, the documents look at the co-occurrences of words and they make underlying implicit inferences about the topics that um, uh, these uh, documents were produced from. So basically, uh, LDA is a, is a method that reads many, many documents and infers implicitly um, uh, several, um, in our case, a few hundred uh, topics that might produce them. And then you can identify each document, in our case, each Glassdoor review, as basically having been produced by a distribution of topics. So basically a probability distribution of topics, and therefore we can now represent each review as a function of the topics of discussion that comprise it. And with that, we have a machinery to measure within and between uh, uh, people diversity. Uh, so what we look at is uh, we observe a variety of firms, um, and each quarter we look at all the reviews that were written by employees of that firm during that quarter. And uh, we compute diversity between people as the average dissimilarity as a function of the cultural topics that each of them discuss between um, uh, employee reviews. And we look at diversity within people as the average breadth, right, the number of cultural topics discussed um, on average within each employee's reviews. So we use the same technology to construct these different measures of w between and within a diverse cultural diversity in an organization. An organization. And what we find um, are, are very, I think, interesting uh, findings. Um, first, we find that consistent with um, roughly 30 years of literature on the importance of the strength of culture and organizations and its impact on coordination, we find that diversity between people is uh, not conducive uh, to profitability. So the more diverse organizations, once again, the x-axis here represents standard deviations. So we see the two extremes on both ends of the, of the scale. As organizations increase in between person diversity, as people describe the organization's culture in very different terms, i.e. we have A's and B's, people who see the uh, world through a Chinese uh, speaking lens and people who see the organization through um, 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 a French-speaking lens, as that increases, um, the profitability, which is conventionally measured as return on asset, decreases. So generally, having different cultural ideas distributed uh, um, uh, or manifest as differences between individuals is not conducive to efficient uh, execution in the organization. However, when we measure um, a diversity within people, we find uh, a variety of interesting findings. We find that um, as people, as each individual in the organization adopts a broader set of ideas and describes the company culture as having a broader um, a set of uh, normative assumptions informing it, uh, that uh, increases dramatically um, um, the company's growth potential is evaluated uh, by the market. So the market to book ratio is basically uh, a common way of measuring the extent to which the market evaluates the value of the company significantly greater than its actual physical assets. The more um, there's a diversity within people in an organization, the more the market values um, uh, that particular organization. And also these organizations tend to produce significantly uh, greater volume and quality of innovation. So amongst the, innova um, the organizations that actually patent, we find that those that ha exhibit higher diversity within people are organizations that produce more patents and that produce uh, higher quality patents. 
So to conclude, uh, I hope that I was able to persuade you that using textual traces to measure cultural distance between individuals and groups and organizations um, is a useful way of understanding cultural processes and its impact on individual and organizational uh, performance, uh, that trajectories of cultural fit predict success, uh, individual success in an organization, that enculturation, the journey that one takes as opposed to the absolute level of cultural fit that one achieves is as important as initial fit and that values, or at least espouse values as communicated when people um, 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 fill surveys are less important in predicting uh, that dimension of success. And finally, that when cultural diversity exists within uh, but not between people, Companies can increase their innovation, but without having to sacrifice their ability to execute efficiently. So thank you very much, and I want to acknowledge again the great work of all the students uh, that we work with. Thank you very much.